Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream podcast. This show has won the COVR Best Radio and Podcast Show, is currently listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to, nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Award, for a Webby Award, and one of the top podcasts in self-improvement and Apple Podcasts. So excited a little bit later on, he's back. David Avocado Wolf is here to talk about superfoods and the longevity multiverse with the latest health and personal development news and strategies. Today, I promise you, it's David. It's going to be cutting edge. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. We thank them for that. If you'd like to become a facilitator or take one of their classes, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger, and I teach spiritual messengers how to write a book. I'm a book writing coach. You can do that with me through privates or through my ongoing book writing group. And you can find out more at debbiedashinger.com. I also take books to a guaranteed international bestseller once they're complete. And I do all the heavy lifting for the author. And the third thing I do is the ultimate visibility formula. I show you how to get interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. I have a free gift for you so you can learn to become way more visible, which is exactly why you're here, and learn to do this big out into the world so people can find you, your being, and your business. And there's lots of templates and videos. Go to debbie-inger.com slash gift. It's spelled D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. So indeed, today I am speaking with David Avocado Wolf, who's the rock star, the Indiana Jones of the superfood and longevity multiverse, the world's top CEOs, ambassadors, celebrities, athletes, artists, and the real superheroes of this planet, moms. All look to David for expert advice in health, beauty, herbalism, nutrition, and Chocolat. He is the visionary founder and president of the nonprofit, the Fruit Tree Planting Foundation Charity, with a mission to plant 8 billion fruit, nut, and medicinal trees on planet Earth. You can learn more. Find him on Instagram at, at David Avocado Wolf or his website at David Wolf O L lfe.com. And finally, he'll be speaking February 2023 at the LA Conscious Life Expo. And that link so you can get your tickets is in the show notes. And with that, I welcome the amazing David back to Dare to Dream. So good to have you here. Thanks for having me back. We're going to have a really good time coming up here this winter with the Conscious Life Expo. And it's great to see you. You look great. You look excited, and I know you got some exciting things ahead for you, and it's going to be, 2023 is going to be a whole new year, a whole new time for all of us, and it's going to be a magical time. It's going to be a magical year, and you know, when you know, you see that there's there's forces at work. We can see the big forces at work, and you can see the forces of evil, and you can see the forces of good, but you know, as those forces of evil get, get bigger, the forces of good have to get bigger to balance it all out. So That's if you're on the good here. side, yeah, where you're on the good side, you're going to get lifted up. And and I have to say that in the last two, three years, that's what I felt. I felt like I've been getting lifted up, pushed up, like in the most miraculous ways, the most incredible things that have happened. And uh, and so I think it's a real positive, actually. You know, this everything's in balance. And yeah. sometimes it swings this way and sometimes it swings that way. But if you're on the right side of history, you'll be pushed up. Yes, I love that you just said that. I'm so, so on this path with you, 100%. I know there's a lot of things going on that big, give people such concern. And I have compassion for that. I understand. I see it too. But my my real feel on the pulse of this is that the underbelly, the ugly has to come up. It has to be revealed for the light to shine on and, and heal. It's the only way through. It's the only way through. It's 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 like facing a drug addiction or something. You have to face it. You have to put light onto it. You have to acknowledge that it's there, and then you can figure out what to do and move forward. And it's it's just that that we're going through collectively as a human race. But if you're already you know not stuck in patterns like that, like addiction or patterns of escapism or patterns of materialism. Things are going to get really, I think, really good for us in the sense that we're going to be just pushed up. The forces of 
of nature are working with us. They're working with the life force. And that's what we focus on, by the way, getting people tuned into the life force energy so that they can build vigorous health. As my teacher likes to say, health beyond danger. That's what we're working on. That's so interesting. I want to ask you this question when you say that, because I have heard that ascension causes physical symptoms, literal physical symptoms, hair falling out, stomach issues. I talked to Daryl Anka about this a couple of weeks ago, and there's been a couple other experts who've been weighing in, and apparently there are patterns out there of people going through ascension who are having physical things happen, even heart things that have been like these weird anomalies. Is this a pattern that you've seen going on as well? Well, yeah, one of my favorite teachers is Rudolf Steiner. Rudolf Steiner was one of the most interesting philosophers of all of history. Just his book, sitting back there on my bed, um, The Riddles of Philosophy. As a person, I spent five years in university getting essentially a philosophy degree. It was a political science degree, but really it was philosophy. It was Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, Kant, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, all those people. Just Steiner's grasp of that Western history of philosophy is absolutely incredible, let alone the other gifts that he gave us. And one of those gifts he gave us, one of the sentences that sticks out is higher consciousness and higher awareness is very toxic. It be, you know, it's really because you're, you're, you're in this avatar, you're in this vessel, and you're just trying to take all this stuff in. It's a lot. It's a lot to take in. It's a toxic thing. So that's why we always have to work on the on the health on the the natural things, for example, getting outside, getting in, like here we can get into the ocean. I'm in Hawaii, so I can get into the ocean every day, at least once a day. I can get buried in the sand. I can lay on the sand. I can get grounded once a day. I can build a fire outside. We're gonna as soon as the storm passes us, we're gonna do a nice little fire outside with all our you know wood and cardboard and things like that, and getting that energy. And as long as you do those key things that are needed for health, like earth, air, fire, and water, plus eating healthy, plus movement and exercise, then you can bring in more of the awareness. But, it, you know, when you're when you're I'm a hyper learner. So sometimes I get so into that that I'm not moving much for a week or two. That's not healthy. Yeah. Yeah. So your house, that's interesting. Last time you were on the show, we had this wild conversation about ayahuasca and you were telling me you had had some friends over and there was this huge storm and the ayahuasca trees were almost falling or they were creating some kind of havoc. And you said you took it as a sign, like maybe I need to let those go. What happened to that? So what happened to that, this is amazing. So what happened was, is that way back in the jungle behind this property, at the very edge of, it's not even part of this property, it's actually just, it's kind of a no man's land out there. There was an ayahuasca vine. It's a vine that had been growing out there for years and years. And I kind of coaxed it along and, you know, it's probably been about a dozen years and 13 years. And then Christmas Eve day or night, Christmas Eve, actually Christmas Eve, 2019, there was all my friends are like, come on, let's just drink the ayahuasca and this and that. And I'm like, look, I'm not a shaman. I don't think I was supposed to serve it. I'm that's not, I'm not my role, this and that. They're like, come on, you know, and we had these shamans show up here at this house and brew and do a whole thing for 10 days. And it was a whole process and it's all been prayed over and everything. So I was like, let me just check in with the spirit. If the spirit gives me a yes, I'm going yes. If it's a no, I'm going no. But I got, I got a yes. And I was like, OK, I'll, you know, just be the six of us. We'll sit and do this. But as the night wore on, like four or five in the morning, the winds really started kicking up really strongly outside. And uh, we went outside and it's like, you know, at the end of an ayahuasca experience, it's nice to smoke a cigar. And so we're out there, it's, you know, me and the guys, you know, who are there, just three gals and three, three guys and three gals. And uh, the guy's like, let's go outside, smoke a cigar, talk about what, you know, what our experience was. But those two guys were still far out and they were still in it. So I was like, well, you guys go back inside and, you know, get back into it. I'm going to stay out here. And the, the winds were just crazy. It was just this insane buildup. It was just like, what is going to happen? And then at the crescendo of it, there was a sound that occurred that I can't explain. I, I couldn't even tell you a similar sound you know maybe a building collapsing something of that nature I mean, it was tight it was a titanic loud sound and i was like something really bad has happened but it sounded to me like it came from the front yard i go out into the front yard the next morning there's not, nothing i look at the whole place nothing at all i was like oh maybe i was just dreaming it up then later a friend of mine goes do you see what happened in the back I was like, no. So right at that spot where the ayahuasca was growing, it's at the very edge of a cattle field over there. The There was three trees literally ripped out of the ground. It was like a mini tornado type of event. And one of them had the ayahuasca on it. And that tree was ripped out of the ground and thrown down the hill. I just looked at it yesterday. It's still, you know, the ayahuasca doesn't mind. It's a vine. It could just vine over if it falls. If it, it doesn't care. It wants to pull the trees down and climb all over the debris. 
And uh, that thing has, has really become a powerhouse. And so after that, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm not serving this medicine anymore. The, the very night that we would do that, that that would happen was too much of a synchronicity for me. So I saved that for the Colombian shamans and the, the Peruvian shamans and the, the shamans from, from South America. That's their work. They serve it. I, you know, I can grow it, but they, they, they're there to serve it. I love that story. And I knew, of course, ayahuasca is a vine. I know it intimately as well, but I knew there was a tree in there. So I'm glad you told that whole story. And that's so powerful. That's so powerful. You ask for a sign, you get a yes, and then something completely different happens, which at least it stops you from doing it again. And what I really like about that story, your sensitivity to following that path, but also I, I do think it's very important that this is truly an indigenous past from one generation to another, very learned in the DNA kind of skill to serve, to brew, to serve and to look over the people who are drinking, right? So they're safe and really have the optimal journey. So it's, yeah, I was talking last night with some friends who were asking me about the ayahuasca experience. And, and I remember drinking one time in Peru with, with a couple, they were a, um, they were a Shipibo mm -hmm. couple and they were in, um, they were in their eighties, you know, 81, 82, 83 years of age, beautiful couple. Mm -hmm. And, and, at one point, I lost my concentration. I started thinking about this girl and her butt and this and that. And I, immediately, he picked up on it. And immediately, he looked at me. And I was like, oh, no, I got caught. And then immediately, I puked all the, you know, the bad energy, I guess, out of, you know, I was off focus or whatever. And, and he got me and I was like, wow, you know, that's a real shaman. That's somebody who's really tuned in. He caught it immediately. And I was like, oh, he caught me. And then blah, everything came out. Yeah. People don't realize who haven't done ayahuasca. It's actually a blessing. We actually are ready for that to happen. You can literally feel something bad inside of you that the water collects around and says, you don't need 90 years of therapy. We're going to get rid of this for you like that. Thank you. Done. <laughs> like, yeah, that's what I love about it is, is it is very therapeutic and in a real sense. And it's also a big part of it is integrating what you've learned through the process. And, and my cousin's here right now. So we've been talking a lot about those integrative experiences of things that have happened through the, in particular through ayahuasca, but also through Native American church, mm. um, which is, which is the peyote medicine and, um, and some of the other things. And just, it's really about integrating like, okay, now I've learned this. I've seen these doors are all open. What do I want to, what do I want to do about it? You know, where do I want, how do I, how do I want these, these insights to maneuver and change my thoughts, words, and deeds? I haven't done peyote yet. What is that like? What is the benefit? It's a little okay. So the the ayahuasca is a is a tryptamine based. So to me, that's more serotonin based, and that means more brainy, yes. more heady, maybe so more a little bit more visual at times. Both can be visual, but generally, I'd say more visual. But the the other side of it is the phenethylamine types of psychoactive compounds, and those are found in cacti, for example, psychoactive cacti like Wachuma or San Pedro and uh, peyote in North America here. And because of, uh, you know, I'm a North American and because I've had many Native American friends and because I have people who lead Native American church, I've been very fortunate enough to be introduced to the teepee ceremony where you sit up in a teepee and you drink that medicine all night. And it's very subtle, I would say, in the beginning and builds up, builds up, builds up. It's not like ayahuasca with like all of a sudden 40 minutes later, you're like, okay, it's on definitely on it could go for hours and you're like i don't know you know i don't know if anything's really happening i'm just praying and you know rattles and pay, praying and doing the songs and whatever and then after like four hours you're like okay yeah i think something's happening here now so it's a slower build up and it's i would say a little bit more of the male energy peyote is more of a male energy ayahuasca is more of a female energy so it's a little bit more like grandfather and, and ayahuasca is a little bit more like grandmother and is it psychoactive? Do you get and do you get wisdom and download? You can. You can. Not necessarily, though. That's important to say. With ayahuasca, I'd say you're more guaranteed for a psychoactive experience. With peyote, not necessarily. You you might have a kinesthetic or body feeling experience, but you may not get all the way to visions or or all the way to communication with deeper parts of yourself or deeper parts with the cosmos. Maybe sometimes you do, not always. Okay. Well, so on, on another path, I understand that you had dairy intolerance growing up. And when you were 18, you stopped cons consuming it. You're getting on this path, trying different diets. And of course, here we are decades later. What is the dieta or dieta or what is the food plan that you follow today? Great. Thank you. I've been a vegetarian for 33 years now. 
So it's been a long time. And not pescatarian, but vegetarian. Vegetarian, right. So like I've eaten eggs and cheese, but I don't eat meat. I don't eat anything that involves killing. If it involves killing something, I'm not I'm not going to have that in my in my diet. So that that's just my personal ethics. That's what I'm into. That's just me. I don't think that's right for everybody, but it's definitely right for me. And I'm glad that those options were shown to me. I spent many years as a raw vegan. I spent 17 and a half years as a raw foodist. And that was all great. And, you know, I'm so glad for those experiences. But at the age I'm at now, I really like where I'm at with it. And I like being able to take ulu, for example, breadfruit here in Hawaii and being able to make a, a, a dough out of it. And you can make pancakes out of it, stuff like that. It's really kind of fun. It's all homemade. So generally, I found with dairy, let's talk about that, that I was really allergic to domesticated animal dairy products. If it's wild buffalo, I, buffalo cheese, I don't have any problem. My body digests that easily. I didn't know that. It took me many years to find this out. If it's, you know, something that's grown in a commercial factory farmed egg or something like that, my body would just instantly reject that. But if it's a local thing, you know, or eggs from the front yard, no problem. I don't have any problem with that at all. So that's interesting is that I think a lot of our intolerances and definitely my dairy intolerance was due to domesticated animals consuming the dairy of domesticated animals. I assume it's probably similar with meat. If somebody's a meat eater that you, you really want like wild animal, not domesticated animal. And it, in Native American church, by the way, like for example, we do the corn meat berries. I don't do the meat, but I do the corn and the berries in the morning after the teepee. The meat is always, it's like bison. That's bison meat. It's not domesticated cow, which is a totally different phenomenon. So that's been a big discovery, I think, in my life. I've suspected it for a long time, but I suspect that what's going on with most people's food intolerances is the heavy spraying on that food, the chemical glyphosate, atrazine, the things that are that are done to the wheat, for example, just to keep it standing up after it's been sprayed 20 times in the season. You know, all of that stuff is really and then it's homogenized and mixed together. So it's all chemicals. It's all homogenized. It's all mixed together. Then it's fed to those domesticated animals. Not a good picture. And it takes us very far away from where we want to be, which is eating directly from nature, wild food food from our garden, food from trees that we've planted, food from wild trees that are out there, that kind of thing. Interesting. I, you know, I'm, thank you for addressing that. So I don't do dairy. I can't. Um, and as a singer, it's the worst thing I can oh, do. You know, I'll lose all my high notes. Even interviewing you, I'll get coded. But here's something very interesting, and I'd love your take on this. I find, even though I've switched to almond and or coconut milk, and I do like Califia nut pods, and I, that's what I have in my coffee in the morning. But I still have a problem with coated throat. I've been muscle tested with them, shows my body likes them. What is up with the coating? Interesting. Well, it's some kind of a reaction. Now, there are things about, like, say, for example, let's say oat milk, for example, That's is really is cool. still relatively, it's still relatively has a high amount of that gluey material in it, that yeah. gluey protein in it. And and that, by the way, is the reason why you see things like, you know, on, you know, with milk, you know, like on the Elmer's glue, it always had a cow on there because cow also that milk has a lot of gluey debris in it. And so it sticks, it sticks to everything. So what my recommendation is, you know, switch it out to something like, you know, something like out of the box, maybe try a coconut oil or in your coffee, or maybe try a, you know, do you, can you consume ghee or does ghee give you that problem? I See, ghee has the protein fraction out, the 10% protein that's in butter, that's out. So the allergies come way down. Like I can consume ghee. I don't do it very often, but I can consume it. Mm -hmm. But I, especially if it was like a bison ghee or camel ghee, where it's they, they've cooked off the protein fraction, it's just a wild animals, um, the, the oil, the basically the cholesterol of their milk. That's really what it is. You know, we hear this, all this bad stuff about cholesterol, but when you've been a vegetarian and vegan, as long as I have, you need a little bit of cholesterol in your diet. You can't have zero. And so I get that from, you know, maybe ghee a little bit here and there. And the wild stuff where the protein fraction is out is better, definitely better. And and I know from my reaction, like I don't react to it, but if I had any cow, anything in my body, my body's going to react. Even sometimes even goat. Huh. It, yeah. If the goats are domesticated and they're eating too much food that's, you know, fed to them, unless they're eating wild stuff, I, I'll have, I'll react to that too. Interesting. I recently tried goat butter and I thought it was exquisite, really like amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I love ghee. It sounds like the coffee might be a little gamey tasting, but 
I'll try. Yeah, maybe. I, I, it's worth a try. It's worth a try. And and just for everyone who's new to this idea of adding oil to coffee, this is a really right. good way to kind of slow and buffer the effects of the stimulants. So it stretches it out, actually, so that you get a little bit more out of your coffee. So if you like your coffee bitter and dark and you put a little bit of oil in it, it's, I think, a better way to do it personally. Yeah, I've done that before, like with MCT oil. And it's pretty delicious. I mean, you it's, think you feel like you have cream in your coffee. It's strange, but it, there's none. Yes. All right. And, you know, I know that you're all about a cleanse, an upcoming cleanse right now. And you say as part of upgrading our operating systems to successfully deal with the shift we've been talking about of this error. What kind of cleanse are you talking about? Okay, so what we do, I've worked this out over 30 years, you know, I've been at this 30 years as a professional, my teachers in the very beginning, they're like, do you think it's about diet now or, you know, your vegan stuff or your vegetarian stuff or superfoods or whatever, but let me tell you in the future, you're going to be, it's going to be about cleansing and, and detox because we're in a toxic world, you know, it's in our air, food and water and, and you'll find out eventually and I already knew at that time that that would probably be my destiny and my teachers were right, they taught, taught me correctly, so we, all these years later we've worked out, essentially it's a three week process and really if you follow that out it's a 31 and a half day process first week we go to one solid meal a day so people who've done juice fast and stuff don't jump ahead just go with what we're doing and we're every single day we're bringing our calories down so we're going vegan and we're going uh, lower and lower in calories throughout the day. We're having one solid meal. And so we're getting used to just one solid meal, right? You can have juices, you want soup, you want liquids, you want water, fine. But all through that week, the calories come down. The second week, we do all liquids. It could be soups, it can be juices, it can be blended stuff, smoothies. But again, you're bringing your calories down through that whole week, the second whole week. Now, on the by the time we get to the third week on day 15, you can kick that off and say, you know what, I'm going to stay with the juice fasting and I'm going to just juice feast for another week or 10 days or months. We haven't had people do months or even, you know, 180 days from that point on. But what I generally do is I go to a water fast. So anybody who wants to follow me in a water fast, you're definitely welcome to do that. And I've and I i I've done about, I think this is going to be my 15th or 16th in the last last since 2018 of of long water fast uh, seven days eight days nine days 10 days 11 days 12 days that kind of a thing and but you can just do one day you know maybe you're like hey i want to try to do one day of water fast maybe you've never done it before okay great we'll get you doing one day and you know you meet that may be day 15 or day 16 somewhere in there and then you can go back to the juices but we're all together in a group so we're communicating with each other daily so it's not like we just like here throw this out okay we'll check in with you in a week it's minute to minute minute it's moment to moment through a chat group and that is and so people are on their phones it's super fun i love it how can they do it with you where do they go if you could track it down you could just go to davidwolf.com w-o-l-f-e and you could track down um uh, my uh, actually what you want to do is, let me give you a better one frequencylifestyle.org frequencylifestyle.org that always has the cleanse right at the top so it's easy to see Frequent, frequency lifestyle.org for folks .org. who want to see that that sounds great and then you can sign up there cool wow you're going to be a clean machine it's really nice to be clean i did have a doctor in um, palm springs palm desert actually look at my fat you know for a stem cell thing he, he put a little rod in there pulled some fat out of this side put a little rod in here pulled some fat out of this side and he showed it to me he's like your fat is healthy mm -hmm. this is rare that i see anything like this especially at your age um, it was vital. I could see it. Like the fat was glowing and vital. I was like, oh, good. That's a good sign. That's a sign that the cleansing, all these years of cleansing is working because, you know, you can like, you know, I'd love to have, you know, more brown in here and, and I don't dye my hair. Um, but in my 50s, you know, I'm doing pretty good. Um, but internally, I'm doing phenomenal. I mean, you know, like I feel like I'm 16 years old. Like yesterday, I was out with a machete with my friends. You know, I'm keeping up with 30 year olds and I'm, you know, I'm actually when it comes to yard work and farming, I can easily outpace anybody who's half my age, but works out in the gym every day. No problem. That's incredible. Um, I remember those tests they used to do on TV. They would take somebody from an audience and a doctor would give a test and say, your actual age is X, but your internal age is 90. It was often shocking. I know you'd be like, oh, my God, look at them. Like, you know, and, and it's good to know that and really get a doctor's opinion. They're doing five to ten of those every day for years. So when they're like, look, your fat looks really good, man, like, check this out. And they're showing it to me. I was like, oh, good. OK, great. So it's just proof that, like, see, it's OK to have some fat because you need some reserves. You have, you know, that's this is 
every pregnant woman is told this, you know, you don't want to be too skinny. You have to have some reserves, but you want that fat to be healthy. You want that fat to be, actually, this is the craziest statement. I'm making a crazy statement. It's super obvious and you can meditate on it for many years and come to the truth of it. The best food for your body by far is your own fat. Which, which means what? In a cleanse, you live off of it? Uh-huh. Yeah, your body stores fat for you, for your metabolism, for your consciousness, for your, your own unique frequency signature. It will store energy for you. Think about that. And so I've really learned that through the years and years of cleansing, decades of cleansing. It's like my body puts on a certain level of fat um, and and that fat is perfect. When I get to the day five, say of a water fast, and I can feel that fat melting off. I'm like, Oh my God, this is the perfect energy source. I feel so good. I'm like, all, you know, in early on it's dirty. The fat's dirty. You're washing out chemicals, the chemicals, chemicals the environment. It's tough in the beginning. But once you get past that and you get to clean, healthy tissue and clean, healthy muscle and fat, then when you're burning off that fat, you're like, wow, this, I mean, you're even for days and you're just like, we well, haven't eaten in a week. And you're like, you get up in the morning, it's four in the morning. You just plow through the whole day. Next thing you know, it's three at night. And you're like, okay, let me sleep for an hour. And then you back up again. That to me is why I keep doing it. It, it brings out a, 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 an ability to work harder, to go deeper, to read the books that I don't have time to read. And I assume then you have a protocol to bring people back out. Yes. Right. So that's the other piece. I'm glad you asked that. So what happens is let's just say we did it like the way I'm going to do it, which is you do a week, one meal a day, you do a week of all liquids. Again, bring your calories down that entire time. And then day 15 rolls around. You're like, okay, let me just try the water for one day. What will end up happening is we'll go through, let's say a week on water. You can't just go back to burgers or bread or, you know, my God, you can't do that. You have to go back the way you came at half the speed. So, for example, let's say you were water fasting for a week and before that you were doing juicing for a week. Well, for three and a half days after the water fast, you go back to juicing. Then you go to three and a half days of just one meal a day. See what I'm saying? You work your way back the way you came in, but half as long. And then by around 31 and a half days, it takes about 10 and a half days to come fully out of the water fast. Then you can start going, okay, I can eat this again. I can have that again. You gradually can get back to eating what you're normally eating, but hopefully with some changes that you learn. With your one, week, one meal a day, are you still having any kind of snack or liquids in between? Or I You guess can have liquids. liquids. But what we're doing, see, the, this is good. I'm glad you asked that too. What, what we're doing is we're working on a habit that people have of reaching for stuff and eating stuff. See, when you start to get into a cleanse, you, you can't just reach and suddenly go, oh, chip, oh, it's chips, oh, you can't do that. You have to liquefy it before it goes in mm. or you save it for that one meal a day. So we're, we're immediately working initially, especially in the first week on the impulse eating, right? Right. Oh, can't eat that. That's that's not a solid. I, my solid meal is going to be a dinner tonight, or my solid meal already happened at lunch. And I, I've got to liquefy that. Let me go get some liquids, and then you start to go. You know what? Let me just tune into my nourishment coming from juices. Let me just tune in my nourishment coming from. You settle your whole consciousness on that, and eventually you go. Let me just settle on my whole consciousness on. I'm lucky I get to drink water. Mm. And when you get there in the water fast, you're like, because they're, when you get deep into the water fast, especially for me, I'm an old timer at this, I get deep into dry fasting where no food or water. And then, you know, at some point I go, wait a second, it's, you know, it's three o'clock in the morning. I can have some water. What am I thinking? I'll just drink some water. Mm -hmm. One of my very favorite things is a heavy metal detox smoothie. Mm. Oh my God. Um, this is so beautiful from the medical medium. It's a great <laughs> recipe. And it's so funny because it's something I used to never engage in. I used to think, no, it's got fruit in it. I can't do fruit. The juice has too much sugar. Like I had all this stuff. It's amazing how much I've let go of. And what I know when I take it in, it's work. It's work to do this. It's a lot to put in a blender. And I add my own stuff. I put spring mix in there and cilantro and stuff. But I have to say that my body is such a huge yum. Every time I do it, it feels so good. You know, I, there's definitely a cleansing that goes on that day. And really, if I can start every morning that way, it's beautiful. It's such a, a hummy way. Like my body hums. That's, I love hearing that. And that's what will happen for everybody. You know, if you're listening, you're like, oh man, I need to drink some vegetable juice. Oh my God. I need, you know, this is the time you're going to get to do that. I, one thing I notice for sure, every time I do a cleanse is how little water I'm drinking when I should be drinking a lot more, because when you're cleansing, you drink a lot more water and you're like, how come I'm not drinking this water all the time? 
you realize it. It's true. Tea, coffee, food, everything takes the place. You're busy. And it's true. Yeah, I yep. think about that a lot, too. I, I yeah. want to talk a little bit about stress, too, because um, there's this really interesting uh, quote from Harry Johnson, which says the human body has been designed to resist an infinite number of changes and attacks brought about by its environment. And the secret of good health lies in successful adjustment to changing stresses on the body. So do you have guaranteed hacks that work for stress? Well, I, the number one thing that I would recommend is when you have a lot going on in your head, mm -hmm. you need to get into your body. So you need to go out and run or walk. You need to get out to the park. You need to get barefoot on the sand. You need to go swimming in the ocean. You need to go into cold water to shut this off, right? Because almost what I've learned about health is that it's all mental. It's all mental stress too, right? Like one per you, it's this easy to tell. We can go to one person and go, let's see what you do every day and what your stress level is. And another person looking at that goes, my God, that would kill me. <laughs> would kill me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so you could just see how people can adapt because of the way they've positioned themselves mentally. So when there's too much going on up here, we immediately do things that embody, that get people back into their body. And and for example, farm work for me is a great way to do that. I'm, I'm out there, I'm swinging off the side of a cliff, I'm swinging my machete. I can't be thinking about I, payroll or you know what I, some other thing. I can't be thinking about that stuff because I'm, I'm in the middle of doing that. And when I break for, when I go, hey guys, I'm going out to the yard for two hours, I don't have my phone. I give myself that time. I measure that out because I know my personality and a lot of people, you know, your personality. If you bring your phone with you, you'll get dragged into the phone while you're out walking your dog or out at the park or out in the forest or whatever you're doing. Really important to know that about yourself. I take a clean break from it. But the other part of it is, is when you're too much in your body and you're not using your mind enough, then you need to actually do some, some head work, right? And you need to sit down and really goal set, set your, your disciplines down. Like, I'm going to do these every day. So there's different types of people. So there's people who are super heady and they need to get in their body more. And then there's people who are super like physical, right? But they don't do enough mental work. And those people need just a little bit more discipline. Like, okay, let me set up my six tasks for the day. Let me set up what my goals are for the year, that kind of work. And so it just depends on where you are. But stress is definitely, a, it's a learned thing. One person's stress is another person's happiness, Hmm. Interesting. That's so true. That is so true. And so I hear you saying, just switch up the environment, do something physical. The so cold, it could even be a cold shower. Cold plunge. Cold cold, plunge. cold showers. I I do that every morning. If I wake up, you know, as you, I maybe have you ever noticed that as time has gone on with your age, right? You you start going. I start getting up groggier, and I'm like, I, yes. this is terrible. Yes. <laughs> so I do a cold shower because once I get in that shower, I'm like, oh, woo -hoo, wow, woo -hoo, woo -hoo. <laughs> you know, I'm just totally in it. I'm like, wow, okay, now I'm awake. Okay, now you know that's better than coffee. I think actually for me, about my body type, definitely better. Oh, that's hilarious. You know, every so often something pops into my sphere and like I just get an energetic read on it and I'm like, uh, yep, I'm going to go to that. I'm going to buy that. And I was looking for something recently. And then this, um, I don't know if I'm going to say it right, gynostema. Ah, gynostema. Gyno Interesting you bring that one up. Yeah. And then it's got another name G with a J, J-I-A-O-G-U-L-A. Jiao, Jiao Gulan is the, is the Chinese name of it. Jiao Gulan, yes. Because of this and, longevity property. So yeah, mm -hmm. I bought, felt, I got, my body went, uh-huh, please. And I bought that and I just started taking this. Are you aware of it? Tell me, tell me about it. Okay. So uh, I, this is one of the things that I think makes me different. You know, this is the Indiana Jones side of me. It's interesting how these archetypes, we get those archetypes as a kid and somehow we come in to embody them. But I've actually not only you know, put the herbs out there into the world and the superfoods and that kind of thing. I've grown them. I've hunted them down in the wild. I've spent years as a, a wild food forager. I've spent years hunting down the greatest superfoods of all different countries all over the world. And Jiao Gulan is very highly ranked for me. So when I got to Texas, you know, I moved everything out of California, moved it all to Texas. And I went and I did that because in 2008, when that crash happened, I was like, the next time this happens, I'm going to go to a place where it's booming rather than busting. And so I did it. I actually, it was a tough year, it really pull everything together, move everything somewhere else. It was a tough experience, but I got there, you know, and what ended up happening is I was like, what's going to grow here? What can we grow here? Cause we were in this, this wood lot, you know, it's like five and a half acres, thousand trees, really wild in Texas. You know, when you get to East Texas, I'm in East Texas, North of Houston. Um, 
It's way different than you think. It's forested. Anyway, we, we started growing Jiao Gulan. We started growing Gynostema. And so every single day I see it, it's right next to, I have these two raised bed gardens that are right next to, to my parking lot and, uh, and they're there and they, and they droop out and hang down. And then we come up and we eat the leaves off of it. This was noted by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, which began in the 1950s to really analyze all the Chinese herbs scientifically. Like, you know, are there people living longer because of these herbs? Who are they? Where are they from? And they found that Jiao Gulan was always the top hundred in Chinese medicine, gynostema, but suddenly started showing up as number one for longevity in the region where it comes from, where people actually consume it, which is South Central China, an, an area that's very well known for its tea, right? A lot of the pu'er teas come from that same region. It's a really, it's kind of a similar environment to, I would say, Texas. You know, it's, 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 it has a little bit of a frost in the winter, but not too much. And mostly you have, you have the heat of the summer and that kind of a thing. And, and, good weather. At any rate, Jiao Gulan became a pick for me and I've been consuming it as a tea and I've been consuming it raw a lot. And I always try to get at least every day, I try to get one Jiao Gulan leaf in because they're, they're, they're like usually five fingered and they're kind of like, they look like, you know, a grape leaf or something. And they're pretty strong, pretty what, just one single leaf is strong. What does it taste like? It tastes very herbal I, it's ah oh, geez it's tough to say it's sweet on the back end so there's a back end sweetness to it and that can be bred and brought out of gynostema it could be used as a non-glycemic sweetener mm. but in terms of the great medicinal properties like the ginsenicides which are saponins that are in ginseng let's, i think there's 20 20 of them or something in ginseng in gynostema there's 120 Wow. So it's just to, like for ginseng, you have to wait 13 years. You have to do all this. It's like, who's doing that? Nobody's doing that. So you, ginseng, you just grow it like you're growing lettuce and you can just eat it and throw in your tea. It's just easy. So that's kind of that's kind of how I do it is I work with the herbs from a very hands on type of approach. Gynostem is a big one. That's it. That's really fun. A, a herb I got into from ayahuasca is tobacco. And that's been a fascinating, the genetics of tobacco is absolutely fascinating. And that's a whole story. It's, you know, kind of off topic. But when, the, when you, if anybody is listening, if you ever go into any kind of a ceremony and they're passing the peace pipe around or, you know, the tobacco, it's, you know, we're not talking about chemicalized cigarettes, which are terrible, 800 additives, 4,000 chemicals. You don't want any of that stuff. But if it's real tobacco that you grew yourself or came from, you know, an, a shaman in the Amazon, it's like this guy grew this stuff himself. That's a totally different story because it doesn't have the 4,000 or the 8,000, sorry, 800 chemicals, 4,000 additives. It's the real stuff. And so I got into really into the genetics of tobacco. I've grown many different types of tobacco over 20 years, just as a hobby and just fun hobby. It, it's so, so cool. interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting when you really get your hands into it. So I, I'm a plant person, as you could probably have guessed. And, and that means to me, I'm like, I'm going to take every opportunity I can to grow all of it. If, you know, if we're going to talk about Pau Arco, I've got epic Pau Arco trees in this property that I grew from a seed that are now as big as this house, bigger than this house. Wow. Incredible. Makes you want to be there with you. Um, so when you say the tobacco, are you talking about rape or and rape or is it specifically just for pipe, for peace pipe? Well, there's different there's different ceremony strategies. Now, if you started out in North American natives, North American natives had nicotiana rustica and certain other wild tobaccos that were native to North America. And they didn't have the tobacco, which is the large leaf tobacco that was brought by, I think, John Rolfe. He was brought into the Virginia colony. And then they started growing the Caribbean tobacco or Orinoco tobacco in North America and changed the whole concept of tobacco in North America. Because before that, it had always been rustica tobacco, which is much stronger. And you have to kind of parse it up and make a kinnikinnick out of it in the sense like you can't just smoke it straight. It's too strong. So you put other herbs in it. And you smoke it as a what's in North America we call kinnikinix, which are smoking mixes. That was a common way of using tobacco in North America, smoking it through kinnikinix. You go into this great civilizations of Central America, and you have like the Mayans, for example. Most of the Mayan workers chewed the tobacco and only smoked it on holidays, and the only the royalty smoked it regularly mm -hmm. in Central American civilizations. As you go into South America, you see that they were smoking it, they were snuffing it, which is rape, and or they. They were um, creating chaws out of it. They were they were consuming it by sucking on it, and you see all of those different strategies employed in South America, which is probably where tobacco is from. But the snuffs to me, the you know the rapé, especially when you sit into a ceremony and somebody goes, okay, you know, I'm going to hit this side, you know, and you get blast on that side, and then you do the other side. 
that to me is really my favorite personally of way of doing it. And it's a great way, like, you know, like four in the afternoon, you're like, let's get a reset. And one of the gals, um, you know, I have a farm in Canada and one of the gals lives on the other side of the farm. She loves doing the rapé. So I go over there or she comes over at like four in the afternoon. She's like, okay, you ready? I'm like, okay. So we sit and we do a prayer, we meditate, and then we do the rapé and then we go back to work. Oh my That's God. Really, really powerful. Yes, yes. We have about 10 different kinds of hape or rape here and all sourced from different places around the world and all different strengths and modalities. Like you could literally feel it when it goes in your body. And we just recently went to Porangui. I don't know if you're familiar with him, the musician. Oh, He's- Porangi. I know Porangi very well. Rad. Is he yeah. going to be a conscious life? Do you know? He's not, but he was just here in LA and we went to his concert. I mean, we were right there, stage, poor and we, us, bam. Bam. Unbelievable. I mean, the fact that he does what he does in real time, there is no music, there's no sheet music. He is creating and channeling. It is so beautiful. We moved we, the whole night. And yeah, when we needed a bump, because it was a late night, you know, we did a little rape and is, you know, we make sure to have our tissues with us because Rape inherently, you know, you let go of everything in the sinus too afterwards. But it's, we it like comes, it. Yeah, it comes out. It's really interesting too to hit the tobacco right up there, you know, that that blood brain barrier you have, the crib reform plate right there in the inside of your na- your nasal cavity. It's, re- it's fascinating system that they worked out. And I, I, again, I think it's the best. I mean, you know, smoking it, you always have some tar and you're like, you know, the mouth stuff. And you're like, what? You know, uh. And, you know, then you have the the idea of like chewing it. I'm like, I don't know about, you know, I'm not coming from Alabama. I'm not going to be chewing tobacco and, you know, you know, spitting it out kind of thing. No way. So, you know, the rap pages is nice and clean and, and it also leaves a nice after effect. It puts you into that glow and it's really cool. Yeah. But is there ever too much? That's my question. Um, and I agree with you. Like I'm this, I love smoking a cigar, but the next morning I wake up, I'm like, oh, like an army march through my mouth, but I love it in the moment. <laughs> A good glass of wine, you know, a cigar. But I have to say the rape, is there, should somebody be conscious of how much they do it? Or is it like sky's the limit whenever? I think three times a day is if you're really working hard and let's say you're a worker and you got to do a lot of physical and mental work. So you're working in a warehouse, you're making stuff all day. Three times a day is kind of a maximum. If you're doing more than three rapes a day, I would say that, you know, you could be heading towards abuse. For me, it's one time a day. For me to do two a day would be very unusual. You know, maybe if I was at an all night festival and, you know, earlier in the day at four, I did it. And then next thing you know, it was three and three and three at night at Burning Man or something. So it was like, let's do a rap. Maybe I could do it there. But generally for me, I'm. I'm a one time a day maximum. And even then I can go months or even years of not doing it. And then suddenly I get back into it for a month or two and then, you know, get back into something else. And I really recommend for people who have addictive personalities to really start bringing those ideas in more where if you're going to do like any kind of tobacco, you know, people come off of these really hard drugs that come onto tobacco and sugar and coffee, basically. Um, don't you know you can't keep those abusive patterns just get out of the idea of abusing yourself and sure you could do a rapé great but just one you know go easy on yourself moderation moderation yeah i'd like you to talk a little bit about um what might be beneficial for arthritis i have read i've done some research and the one thing i was able to unearth is mediterranean could be very beneficial Mm -hmm. but I'd, i'd love to get your input I like Mediterranean diet. It's okay. So let's just take this down from again, Rudolf Steiner. We talked about Rudolf Steiner, I think before the show got started and Rudolf Steiner had this idea that people who tend to be very, you know, like disciplined, um, type A personalities, um, you know, like we're going to bounce check, but we're going to get the bills paid. We're going to do all this tend towards calcification diseases, which is like arthritis is a calcification disease. And therefore need the other counterbalancing forces, forces of escapism to balance the inner workings of the things that cause the accretion of calcification or hardening of the tissue. Okay, so people who tend to be workaholics, to be, you know, we're going to get the job done, we're, you know, nine to five, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Is that you? Um It's generally what's going to happen is, is that it's going to cause a a calcification problem of the heart or the brain or the joints. And that's what the arthritis is about, right? You're getting bursitis. You're basically getting crystalline growths into your, into your joint tissue. 
And it, so first comes the, the overall mental picture of it all. So that's, that's that piece from a spiritual picture. It's more, you're, you're too embodied, right? You're so embodied. You're so on the earth that eventually you're starting to have crystallizations of earth in you. You're having development of crystallization. Okay. So key thing there is, is making sure that you are also in connection to the living earth and you're not just a rock. So that means movement on the over on the, movement yoga movement in particular grounded to the earth so let's say you're in a park like do the yoga on the grass where so the energies can move from the earth through you so you're not a rock you're you're in movement um and then so we know for example with pain and let's say the pain of let's say let's say it's a knee joint or something if you can get your feet on the ground with that knee joint within an hour the pain will generally be gone or almost gone within 90 minutes it'll be gone if you have knee pain because you're connected to the earth itself you're electrically connected to the earth itself there's a direct skin to skin connection okay so i hear you saying earthing right mm -hmm. so that's or that's so your earthing the piece, yeah. on the mm -hmm. bottom of the shoes let your feet fingers, all of it plant directly into the earth so that energy can be transmitted through you. And what else can be done? I mean, this is, I've never heard anybody say what you're saying the, right now. This is huge. Topically DMSO and sulfur. So one of the big game changing supplements that's ever happened is MSM, methyl sulfonyl methane. I have it. And you have it. So I would take, you know, especially, you know, if you're going through like, you know, a healing process, really, I recommend that people uptake 5,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 5,000 milligrams of MSM. You have to work up to that. You can't just go, okay, today, I'm, you know, out of, from zero to 5,000 is too much in one day. Go to zero to 500 or a thousand milligrams of both those vitamin C and MSM as an addition to your diet, as an addition to a healthy diet that you're eating, you know, you got to make sure you have sprouts and you got to make sure you're having salads and you got to make sure you're having the right protein for you and the right fats and oils and no canola oil and all that stuff. But the additional stuff, I would say the vitamin C MSM combination Now, the sulfur is antagonistic to calcification. And so it alone, especially if you can get it there topically, that's what DMSO is able to do. DMSO2 with an extra oxygen on it is actually MSM, methyl sulfonyl methane, mm. right? So it's MSM is a form, it's a crystallized form of the liquid DMSO. What I love about DMSO is you can target it directly to the tissue. Now we are, when I get to the Conscious Life Expo, I'm going to be with a friend of mine there and him and I have been working on getting a product out that's called that's a carbon 60 in glycerin oh. spray yeah. in spray I, i've seen some crazy you know i i that's a product i'm going to be really hitting heavy 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 at the event because that stuff is straight up one of the most miraculous products i've ever seen hmm. um so for example let's just say like um gout Okay, so gout's a crystallization, kind of an arthritic kind of a situation, and gout's generally caused by, you know, eating too much sugar, not moving around enough, it, it hits when the when the heat hits of summer is usually when it hits. What can you do? Well, one of the things you've got to do is got to get moving, you got to get your body cooled off, maybe cold showers, and, you know, the things that are naturally antagonistic to gout, movement and cold generally are antagonistic to gout, and, you know, changing your diet so you're not, you're actually getting no synthetic oils or processed oils and you know fake salt and you get the real salt all that stuff but the key thing is that this this stuff one bottle can stop gout and i've never seen anything like that ever I have nothing 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 um if somebody has a real bad gout outbreak or let's say let's say it's a um another arthritic thing i always recommend hot caster packs because oh. caster is able to to penetrate Oh. Caster. So when I say caster pack, I mean, you soak an old linen, like an old piece of cloth, and you soak that into the castor oil. And then you put that on the skin and you put a piece of plastic over it. And then you put a hot water bottle on top of that. So you, you're using the plastic to separate the oil from getting all over your hot water bottle. And with a lot of heat, you try to get that into your hip or your knee or wherever the problem is. And that's really good at dissolving like DMSO, dissolving those crystals. But this carbon 60 spray is like a whole nother level of any i've never seen anything like it it's just it, and you're not it's like it's not a dmso dmso is a solvent it goes through your skin the the carbon 60 it's like how's it penetrating all into the joint and doing this exactly but it does it gets all the way into the joint and shuts off the inflammatory markers and for you actually if i was with you let's say you have your hip thing going on 
I would immediately take an entire bottle of, of carbon spray and say, use this entire bottle up in, five, in like five days. Just spray it 10 times every day right on that spot. And you might be surprised actually by what happens. Okay. Um, it's because it creates nucleation sites, carbon nucleation sites. So it's not only wiping out the inflammatory response, but it's creating new tissue nucleation sites. New tissue nucleation sites. That's the only way I can describe it. It's basically like if the tissue is damaged, your the structure and skeleton of your whole body is carbon. And for whatever reason, the carbon-60 molecule is able to reset that skeleton in an area that's been damaged and re reorganize it. So, for example, with a gout, you're like, this is going to be months. Oh, my God. You know, even if I do caster packs, what am I going to do? It, within a week, it's gone. That's it. Gone. Wiped it out. It's like, what's happening there precisely? It has something to do with creating new carbon nu nucleation sites. Another place that that would be useful, let me just make it real easy for men out there, male pattern baldness. You spray it right on the spots where the problem is, and the and it creates new carbon nucleation sites. So the tissue grows new from that site. Oh my gosh! You better bring some now. I'm bringing some. I'm going heavy on that. Bring, that. That's one of those for for our community. I mean, it's you know how it is with our world. It's like I don't even know how long they'll keep it legal. It's because it's that kind of level right. of power. Exactly. So I will just get better. it to the people until they shut it down. Then we'll find something else. We'll get that to the people until they shut it down. I mean, it's just terrible. We live in a world like that, but whatever. We'll do what we got to do. Yes. Agreed. <clears throat> and very cool about the caster packs because, um, gosh, ever since I first read Edgar Casey materials like a billion years ago, and he was a huge proponent of that to heal many things in the body, these hot castor packs. And I still have one of these cloths and I still always buy the castor oil. So I'm good. Like a lot of the stuff you're naming, this is beautiful. I have on hand. Don't mm -hmm. have your, your C60 yet, you know, till I see you in February. Um, and I have a question because, so a lot of this is addressing things we could do out in the grass and move the body and things we can take that will help to heal. What about here? What about mm -hmm. here? What can we mm -hmm. do with this? If we're that, I'm not, I am exactly what you described. I'm not that intense. I don't know if I'd say an A because I'm A personally, because I'm also a free spirit, but I'm very disciplined and I really get stuff done. And yes, if it's not complete, I can keep working and la la. But you, uh, you, you may want to lighten your load. You know, you may want to think about that and just, yeah. you know, because I'm getting to a point now where people like, you know, don't you want to do business with this? Don't you want to take this business opportunity? And I'm like, no. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I, I'm, you know, if I became a billionaire, great. But it's not like I'm going to, I'm not beating myself to death trying to become a billionaire. That I'm not doing that. And so if it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I don't take on, you know, my mouth has overburdened my back regularly for a long time. And I need to be very careful of that. And I think I'm not alone in that statement. My mouth overburdening my back is not, I'm sure you've done the same. And so I have to do that in order to stay healthy. Otherwise I will just take on too much. And then comes the calcification problems. And eventually that leads to heart problems and stroke. That's calcification problems where you're having blockage or plaque buildup. See, these are, these are plaques. Now, the other side of that, by the way, is the disintegrative forces in nature, which is another whole mindset. Now, I would recommend if you're having very, you know, hardening and calcification, you need to move further towards what we call like, you know, it, basically further into more of light work. Really, that's really the best way of saying it. Light work, working with light, working with the light, working on light, working out in the light you know, with the sun in the light, you know, light work, literally, because it's the opposite of the material. Think of crystallizations, right? Crystallizations occur in the earth, in rocks. You know, you don't want your body to be like that. You want light in there, light in that tissue. That's so amazing that you're even saying that because I'm also taking that a step further. I've just recently become so fascinated with light language and it's been in my life for a while with other people, but I'm now, I'm in a group for it. And the moment I've opened myself up to it synchronistically, like the most you can't write this kind of things have happened around light language, people who are very proficient and expert at it coming into my sphere, on and on. And so I'm even thinking, oh, lighten up, you know, maybe even light language is a way because that is a way connecting not with the ground, but with, you know, source energy. It's God's language to let come through. And there's a lightness to that. 
There's something to be said too. You know, I have a friend of mine who's a very type A personality, very incredible entrepreneur. I mean, he runs, you know, he's running like three businesses. He's, he's, he's doing three businesses at once, almost like all as a hobby while raising a family. You know, it's just, it's crazy how hard this guy works all hours. I can call him at three in the morning. He will answer immediately, you know, anytime. And, but he does observe the Sabbath. Oh. So he does actually take the entire day off from everything. So that's getting into the light. So he gets out into the light. He gets out under with the dogs, out under the sun. He gets walking and he gets away from the phones. And he gets away from everything else. So see, this is the opposite of what's happening in the deep recesses of the joints in the earth. Crystallizations are occurring because we're getting too into the material world. We've got to step, you know, we're a light being. We've got to step out of the material world so we don't get ground back into stone. Uh, most Western karmas end up in stone formation. Most Eastern karmas end up into, into disintegration. Hmm. So like diabetes is a disintegrative condition. Right. So so the guru says this, none of this is real. It's all an illusion. It's hallucination. They're, actually, what will end up happening with them is they're going to end up with diabetes because they've renounced the world. And therefore, you have to have because we're in the world. So we have to participate in the world. We can't renounce the world. That's going too far, in my opinion, on um, my research. But we can't get so far in the world that we become crystallized part of it. We become plaqued into it. Wow. I, I already know people are like wow, getting so much out of this. I know I am. This is amazing. I want to ask you about um, Scott's Pine. Mm -hmm. Scott's Pine creates something and studies have shown that testosterone can be found in the pollen of the That's pine. Right. Is that true? And is it good, beneficial for men or and or women? You know, this is something really near and dear to my heart. I've spent, I mean, you know, a friend of mine showed up the other day and, you know, we we're talking about our history with pine pollen. I was trying to remember how far it went back. It went back far. It's like 15 years or something that we've been on. It's maybe 20 years that we've been aware of it, where the Scots pine is a very commonly planted and beautiful ornamental pine that people have in their yards. And originally, I think from Europe, heading maybe even as far all the way into the Ural Mountains is that region of Europe to the Ural Mountains where the, the Scots pine is native. Mm -hmm. And then it was brought ornamentally over to North America. And it's a common pine tree. And it produces a pollen and all pine trees produce a pollen like this. That's very rich in five classes of hormones. The, the most common is the brassinosteroids, which is testosterone, DHEA, androstenedione, and androsterone, those four. And if you take the pine pollen and eat it, you're going to get some of those four and all the other groups as well. So that's those fall in the brass and steroids. There's also four other categories of steroids in, in the pine pollen, but those are the most well-known and most, you know, desired, you know, people are like, I want more testosterone. Okay. Um, but if you eat it, you have to eat a lot of it because a lot of it's broken down in digestion. So it, it, people have figured out, Hey, let's put the pine pollen in alcohol. And then we'll see if we can get the, under the tongue, the, the brass and steroids to actually get right in without being digested and broken down by the digestive system. If we ate the pine pollen. And so that's the best way to do it is in glycerin or in alcohol tincture. So you get the absorption directly into your mucosa of the hormones so you can raise your DHA or testosterone or androstenedione or androsterone. This is good for men and women, by the way. It's good for men and women. It's not just a men thing. Um, but I, I will say this, I have noticed like, because we produce a Loblolly pine product from Texas. And this is due to my experience with pine pollen over the years. And uh, I've, I've picked pine pollen from Iceland all the way to South America and everywhere in between. And one of the things I've noticed is that there's a really dominant pine in North America called the Loblolly pine, Pinus tata, and it dominates the South. It dominates Florida. If you've ever been to Florida and you like look out the side of the car and there's all these pine trees, you know, kind of spindly pine trees, those are all Loblolly pines. Mm -hmm. And those, those produce a really nice pollen. And so we put that out as a product this year as tincture and, and in glycerin. And it's be, it's actually from the internet, just the broad internet gets us the most new people coming in because the word is out about it. Word is out about it. And what does it do specifically? What are its benefits? Well, it's 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 loaded with every anti-aging compound you could ever think of from magnesium to iron to zinc to, you know, any of those minerals is just a 
B vitamins, this and that, um, that is loaded to those things. But the hormones are like master switches, right? They're higher up on the chain. Like we turn testosterone on, everything else down below gets switched on. It's way up higher. And that's why people lock into it. And I, and I will say I ate a lot of pine pollen this year. It was a major thing for me because we, you know, we were collecting it. We're making products out of it. We're eating it the whole time. We're doing tinctures of it every day. It's really an incredible thing and it tastes good. That's another thing. There's nothing like you, you know, when I want the taste, the taste is great. It has a subtle pine flavor a little bit, but you know, you could sprinkle it on ice cream if you want, or you could, you could, any way you could use it is just amazing. And if somebody's taking, for instance, bioidenticals for hormones, or they've got a pellet, or you know, maybe the various ways, shots and so forth, is it still okay to ingest the pine, or could that set you off? Set you great. Home? It's still okay. Yeah, it could raise your testosterone or androstenedione or androsterone or DHEA or other ones. But when you're taking bioidenticals, you know, you're being monitored, hopefully every three months, so that somebody you you know you get a blood test and you're like, okay, you're in range. Okay, you're in range. Oh, something different happened here. What'd you do? Oh, I was taking the pine pond. Oh, look, everything went up right here, and so you can monitor it and. Generally, what I'm trying to do is before we go to bioidenticals, let's go to what nature produces first. Let's get the pine pollen and glycerin. Pine pollen and glycerin, by the way, in my opinion, is my best stab at a bioidentical hormone that comes from nature. Wow. Mm -hmm. And my, that's, if I had to give a gift of like my gift to bioidentical hormones, you know, from my career, that's it. It's the pine pollen and glycerin because glycerin doesn't degrade molecules at all. It tastes absolutely delicious. And it's immediately like, like, for example, let's say someone has just gone through their moon and they take a bunch of glycerin pine pollen. The moon can come back right there. Like it'll immediately, you'll meet your hormones will immediately kick on. It's that strong and just a couple droppers full. Mm -hmm. So that's my, that's my gift to that world. When it comes to the alcohol tinctures, more common product, it's not as, um, the alcohols doesn't keep the molecules as, as, uh, the alcohol eventually starts to degrade the molecules because it is, is it somewhat of a, it's a word I want to use. It's it's somewhat of a of a um it dries things out, right? It's mm -hmm. the the alchemist used to say it was a liquid fire. Hmm. Right. When something's an alcohol, if you pull that material out and you put it outside, it's been dried out in some weird way. It's like a liquid fire in, in certain respects. Fascinating. I've been engaging in red light therapy and also that on the spot cryotherapy. What are your thoughts about both of those? I love laser therapy and cryotherapy and, and had a lot to do with getting the word out there about cryotherapy, especially on the spot st stuff like cryofacials, for example. And it's just an amazing thing that we've discovered the importance of cold for health. If we're going to, let's say, you know, there's these people who are like, oh, okay, when I die, I'm going to be frozen. I'm going to be revived, you know, 500 years later. You're not going to be heated up. You're going to be frozen. Why are you going to be frozen instead of heated up? Because the freezing slows down all the metabolic activity and preserves all the tissue. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge thing. I think Wim Hof has had a big part of it is mm -hmm. getting people to the realization that like you want cold. Cold is good. Too much heat. You're inflamed. That's inflammation. Cold water, jumping into cold water. Go outside if you can. Let's say you're in your backyard. It's the middle of winter and you could be naked in your backyard. Well, go out and do it. You know, go out there and just feel all the elements and just Feel what it's like to be, you know, a person on the earth that you bring in the stars and the heavens all through your body and bring in the cold and invite in the cold. Cold is anti-inflammatory. Cold is longevity inducing. The longest lived people in Europe are the Icelanders of all like what them. It's freezing up there. But there's something to be that something to that slowing the metabolic rate and the powers of cold to preserve tissue that comes through on that. Now with laser, laser treatments, I really like red lasers in particular and red light. I have a red light actually over here in this bathroom that I really like to, you know, be under that. It's like an old seventies light bulb. You remember those from the seventies, you know, with shag carpets and those, those big red light bulbs. Those are really great. They warm you up at a real deep level and they hit some of the incubation frequencies. So for example, in infrared, I think it's about, I think it's 750, 758 nanometers is an is an incubation frequency that your mom puts out into you when you're being born, you know, when you're being built up in the womb and all that. And so those are the colors, you know, that's that's when you get that red light therapy. Those are the frequencies you're getting. You're getting those those incubation frequencies and many others that I don't know about or that, you know, I haven't studied enough to know or that maybe we don't know a lot about. But generally, the idea is, is that the 
penetrates deep into the tissue so you can get the effects the anti-inflammatory effects deeper into the tissue than say you know a surface treatment oh incredible yeah i'm experimenting the one i go in is a bed so i literally lay in the bed and pull the top over and this has presets so you decide i think there's like eight and inflammation, sports injuries, anti-aging, there's all these different ones. And I'm just experimenting with it right now. I try the different frequencies and, you know, you lay there, it's very relaxing. It's like, it's so simple to just receive and like, yeah, just to raise and it, just to receive. And this is good for, you know, like, let's say a personality like you and I, hardworking constantly, we need to re- let go and let the light come in way more. And that's why uh, to me, fasting and cleansing is really important. It's not just about the fasting and cleansing. It's about, I have more time so I can actually treat myself to a massage. I can treat myself to a light therapy because those are treats. It'd be nice to have that every day, but I I don't have that every day, you know, and I'm in that field. If I don't have it every day, I'd love to have that every day, but I'd be lucky if I get a massage once a month. Yeah, totally. Same. (laughs) Uh, we should be accountability partners, right? Yes, totally. Like, how's it going? Call them up. Get off your phone. <laughs> Go get a massage. It's true. I would love all of that too. And it's so luxurious and joyful when I do that. Um, I want to ask you about UFOs and ETs. I don't know if mm. you're into it. I don't know if you believe in it. I don't know if you have experience. I'm totally into it. What is your deal with that? Over the years, I ended up more in the Jacques Vallée camp, oh, and yeah. and he, we had the same publisher for a while, so I was able to you know see what he was up to, and you know oh, here's the latest thing he's doing, which is more of the interdimensional side, right? So I never really believed it's like okay, a little green man gets on a ship from you know this galaxy over here, and then it goes three trillion light years. No way, sorry, not buying any of that. It's not that. It's some kind of an interdimensional phenomenon. It's in the dimensional interface can sometimes be very diff, like energetically different. Mm -hmm. So for example, beings coming in from some other higher fractal dimensions just have a difficult problem. We have a difficult problem interacting with them and they have a difficult, difficult problem reacting with us because they're, they're in a different time and energy signature. Yeah. So something like that's going on. Yeah. And do you have any experiences? Well, I've had a lot of experiences with people who've been abducted. Mm. And and so, like, for example, I used to do a lot of one-on-one work. Like, we'd do a retreat, we're doing a cleanse, and then, you know, someone would be like, okay, I'd sign, you know, five people up that day, you're going to do one-on-one with me, and I'll do, we'll do body work, we'll do everything. Whatever's, whatever I'm feeling is needed, we'll, that's what we're going to do for that hour or hour and a half. And so, the, I would have things multiple different times in many different places, people who could never have known each other, and they're going to give me a John Mack abduction story. If you remember John Mack, I think he was from Harvard or he's from one of those Ivy League schools and he came clean. He's like, there's something going on. I don't know what this is, but, you know, I've got to report this because these are the patients that I'm interviewing and here's what's going on. And so because of studying John Mack's work and the abduction literature that's out there, I knew certain hallmarks, you know, and, and then people would tell me and be like, this happened, then that happened. And I'd be like, let me guess. Then this happened next. They're like, yeah, how did you know? And I'd be like, let me guess. Then probably this. And they'd be like, yeah. So I've had many experiences like that that tell me it's a legitimate phenomenon. It, it's a legitimate phenomenon. Something's going on. Um, it's something I think it's very difficult for us to comprehend. So we interpret it into, oh, a little green man or the grays or, you know, on they're coming in a spaceship from over here to over there. But it's not that. It's not that. There's play, There's very strong evidence that the phenomenon is localized to certain geographical areas especially with the grays, right? So that there are somehow crypto terrestrials that they're there, they're living in the ground there. They're somehow related to that or that that dimensional doorway breaks down and suddenly they're showing up more Then it dissipates a little bit and then they don't show up, but it's usually geologically grounded. It's a, there's a certain spot off the coast here, actually. We were talking about it last night, about 200 miles north of the Hawaiian islands is something. There's something in the ocean out there. And every now and then, especially um, because we're very far on the North shore, we can see it. You know, there'd be lights out there. Like, what's that? Now, is it the U S government? I don't think so because the Hawaiians say it's always been like that. Mm -hmm. I love it. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. I recently had Matt LaCroix from Gaia TV. He's an ancient history expert. Wow. What a conversation. And 
I mean, first of all, he's talking about, we look back and say everybody was hunter gatherer, but when in fact they were advanced civilization, he, Graham Hancock, people like this, they have so much proof of this. And part of what was going on back then was portals, right? Mm -hmm. And much like what you're talking about, and because that was how they would interdimensionally come through here. And so that whole thing right now for me is really big and up and I'm reading, researching, ingesting a lot of it. I believe in it so strongly. And Bashar said just a couple of weeks ago, 2023, get ready because there's gonna be a lot more activity. So those lights you're seeing, David, I keep checking out there. And don't just see if there's lights now, see if something else starts happening because they are going to start making more of an appearance. And everything I've read, I'm, I agree, I concur that it is a frequency and they are so advanced, their frequency is so high that it's difficult for them to lower it just to interact with us and same for us to, to raise our vibration. But I will say Friday night, I had this, I, I've never had anything happen like this, but I absolutely had an ascension dream, 100%. And I call it the divine that was working with me in the dream but the truth is i don't know it could have been extraterrestrials i don't know it was extremely advanced and it was asking things of me it was i was also in a dream at the same time and watching these healing modalities i created and being of service to people and through my music but other like apparatus in a room and it was like amazing to me and then the divine would come in and ask something of me and i would freeze because i think oh boy i'm at a crossroads if I say, if I say no, it's going to be this offer will be off the table forever, but I don't know what happens if I say yes. And I would just surrender and say yes. And then I had like intense healings and energy and vibration. And even my body was being lifted in the air and all sorts of stuff. I woke up so grateful on Saturday morning and I really had felt so loved. And I, when I went to bed Saturday night, I was like, can we have some more? <laughs> Could that not be the end? Could we like do the sequel now? Because that was freaking awesome. I mean, did you get back there? No. It's it's tough to get back into the dream space where you were, were before. It's almost like I don't know how much control we have over that. I had a crazy dream the other night uh, when I first got here, Friday night, I think it was. I had a dream that I was tossing and turning. Hmm. Really? I had a dream that I was tossing and turning while trying to sleep. Then I woke up and I was like, wait a second, I'm not tossing and turning. I've been asleep the whole time. And I went and used the, the bathroom and they came back. That was an unusual dream, I have to say. Very strange dreaming of tossing and turning. And then early in the morning, around 3.30, maybe 4 a.m., I had a dream. I was in my bathroom here and then a white a light came. It was below the house, but above the ground. It came underneath and shot across the yard like that. There's a very strong ley line here that goes on along that pathway right here hmm. and uh and then then it had some information that it was passing along and that that came in my dream and and uh, my, one of my neighbors showed up and we discussed it in the dream and then later i talked to him about it and so it was just you know it was like i get some of that especially in hawaii where light entities of some sort will somehow intrude into the dream space and somehow get try to get you some information something of that nature it is interesting though that this phenomenon that ufo phenomenon appears to have something to do with um there's two themes one is the genetic modification of humanity that's mm -hmm. a theme that comes up a lot the other one is the way that we're trashing this place big time that's another common theme that i've seen in, in all that literature and so that appears to be of concern to whoever these interdimensional beings are 100%. Yeah. And the nuclear, the whole nuclear system we've got going here, which they, they have intercepted many, many times and still watch over because it is said, you know, I have many people come on the show who channel extraterrestrials and can speak very wisely about this, but they make it clear to us, look, you want to destroy your planet? Awesome. Pretty stupid because it's a beautiful place. It's kind of a nice to have a life, right? And a body for as long as you have it. But pretty stupid. But guess what? Your impact, this has ramifications. You set some, something off nuclear. It's not just that country, those people, this planet, all throughout space, galaxies, universes. Or you, dimensions, right? Like it's, it's something like that for sure. 
Um, by the way, on that point, you know, I spent a lot of years trying to crack into, you know, the truth or veracity of the explosive power of nuclear weapons. And so, you know, I'm not, I, by the way, I do not believe that it's one bomb destroys one city. Mm -hmm. um, with explosive power, I think what they're really what the nuclear weapon is, is it's a dirty bomb. Mm -hmm. And so you have, you know, it's kind of like what happened. Remember about two years ago, there was that bomb explosion in Lebanon. Remember that yes. down in the port? Imagine put a, an explosion like that, but you put nuclear debris like polonium, plutonium and uranium on that and then just fire that everywhere. That's the real dangerous weapon. And that's they're using those weapons, by the way, depleted uranium munitions have been used. And that's something that really irks me. It really does. But I, by the way, I just want to put that out there and interject that to everybody who wants to research it. The explosive power, like what happened to Hiroshima and Nagasaki were mostly napalm. It was mostly firebomb. It wasn't the one bomb destroyed the whole city or the one bomb destroyed all of Nagasaki. It wasn't that. And you could see that the, the radioactive whatever isotopes degraded quickly. And th those cities are bustling healthy cities today. How's that possible? Because we're not being told the whole truth on this subject. So I just want to inspire that type of research. I, I found it to be interesting. I personally, again, think that the destructive power is a hoax. What the real danger is, is that they're going to put a very high powered weapon and then blast nuclear debris and nuclear um, waste everywhere. That to me is a very, very dangerous problem. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, even <clears throat> worse than anything I've heard, but very possible. It's very possible that what people will do out of greed and I'm right and you're wrong and it's like and just just demonic possession or something. I mean, I more and more I, I I'm curious about that. More and more I look at it, the more and more I go, these people they're possessed by demons. It's, it doesn't. There's nothing about any of this that makes any sense. It's the narcissism, the sociopathic behavior, the this and the that, the lying, the incessant lying, the nonstop lying. You're just like, that doesn't, I don't even know people who are like that. This is like a demonic possession. What are your thoughts on that? I, I, that comes up for me a lot. That's interesting. I've never considered demonic, although it makes perfect sense to me. But there is something so aberrant, so entitled, and yes, narcissistic, clueless, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, clueless. Is I mean, up a peace. Lot. It's so easy, right? Right. It's just you know, it's the same just, amount of energy to go the other direction. Absolutely. It's and like just on this farm, there's so much to do. Like, what do I have to do? I mean, I have to be plotting how we're going to bomb these people and this. And I mean, it just makes no sense. It's just people don't have their, they have no, their values are just completely distorted. I don't know what to say about it. It's like, you, you're going to go bomb somebody like, well, how about plant a tree? Let's, let's, how about start a farm? Yeah. How about let's, let's observe and behold the mystery and magic of mother nature and creation and see what that's like. And, you same know, energy, of you. by the way, but uh -huh, same amount of energy. Lot. And by the way, and same, I always think this about hackers, like my Facebook account, like, Estupido, right? These, these people, I don't even understand them, but they took my picture, my blurb, my bio, reprinted it and started friending all my friends. And thankfully, my friends immediately started texting me and going, there's some whack job out there pretending they're you. And I knew it was you. I could tell right away. And it was so beautiful. I mean, to fix these things is actually very simple. I wrote to the seven people really fast who had agreed to friend this hacker, got them off, wrote to Facebook. I am telling you, like in 10 minutes, that page was down. I'm like, don't, I ain't playing. So don't even think you're going to. It's, do it's that. crazy that people even do that. Like you have time to do that. Like what? I, I just don't get it. It, it, it definitely, it's definitely a crisis of education for sure. Like get kids creating, get kids, you know, or knowing how to balance a checkbook, get, get kids, you know, doing things that are productive, like planting trees and planting a garden and things that are real. But when you get people too much in their mind and too much on their devices, next thing, you know, you have this kind of stuff happening and you're just like, why would they do that? Why would they pick you? Like you're okay. They're going to hack you. And like, like why? Yeah. And they do it a lot on Instagram too. They take people who are very gifted and they'll replicate their accounts and say, can I give you a reading and ask for money? So I know all this, but I'll tell you, I look at these people and think my heart breaks for you because you're a genius. Honestly, if you can do all this and understand you're a genius and think about if you just switched paths 
the money you could make and the good you could do, how you could turn your entire life around and use those same skills for good. I well hope said. you're listening to me and I can help change them because I would support them so much in writing their path. There would be zero judgment, just like you can do this. If you are that smart, like we need you, but the yep. light needs you. Yes, totally. Yes. Right? I, and I think that's, we're, we're, you know, to me, the changing of the age, the age that we're coming into, the end of the Kali Yuga, the mm -hmm. theosophists, Rudolf Steiner, Sri Yukteswar, they said that the Kali Yuga ended in 1899. Mm -hmm. And then, so what we're seeing now, I think the first step out is the apocalypse, which means we're seeing it all. We're seeing all the corruption, like, oh my God, these people are stealing all this money and all, you know, the endless wars and we're seeing all that. So that's the first step is the, just seeing it all. But ultimately the yuga, the next yuga and the yuga that we're entering into right now is about a change within us. Mm -hmm. It's a change. It, we're becoming more clairsentient, more clairvoyant, more clairaudient. We're yes. becoming tuned into our heart. We're becoming tuned into the idea that our heart rules our mind, not the other way around. All of that are changes that are happening within us. And so as that age develops, and this is, I think it's a long one. I think it goes like, you go like 12,500 years to the peak of it. And then it's another 12,500 years to get us kind of back to um, where we're going into like a, a lower energy age or something, you know, in the cycles of the ages. It's we, we're just at the beginning. So, you know, 12,500 years, long time. And so I think it's going to come in stages. And I'm pretty sure this one, the first step is the apocalypse, which means you get to see all of the corruption and the evil. And so that's important. you got to be aware of it. And then the second piece is the changes that come in with us that cause us to go, okay, now we're aware of that. And now we're moving this way. Now we're doing, making these choices. Thought, word, and deed is taking us this way because we know what that is and we don't want that. So we're going to go this way. And that might be step two. That is so well said. I 100% concur. I'm living it. I'm seeing it on the planet. I'm seeing other people go through it. And actually, I think that was a very inspiring thing to tell people and to get their minds around that. You know, especially light workers, so, so sensitive that can feel so much to remember half, most of that's probably not yours. And you came here to do good work. Like you've got an army around you to do what you came here to do. You're going to be okay. You really are. So David, like, first of all, I adore you so much. I really have loved this conversation. And tell us what you're going to be talking about. Conscious Life Expo, Los Angeles, February 10th through the 13th, 2023. The link, you can register to go live, who wouldn't want to, from anywhere in the world, go live. Or if you have to live stream for whatever reason, you can do either. The link will be in the show notes. Tell, tell me, what are you talking? What are you talking about? I, I didn't know, you know, how far they wanted me to go. So the first thing is I was like, let me get into here. I'll talk about blue pigments and yellow pigments, nobletin, and talk about quercetin and, you know, some of these really oh. interesting things, phycosine. Well, that was, I was what I was going to do. That's what I was going to do. But then they're like, no, we want you to come in here and talk. Like, what if somebody got the jab and they had side effects? And what if, you know, what if somebody, you know, suddenly was in the hospital and they, you know, this and that. And I was like, Oh, no problem. I mean, I'll talk about that too. No problem. I mean, I, I spent, I, I've, you know, I've told you this before, but I've been on Dr. Fauci's case since 1990. I met Dr. Peter Duesberg. He came and spoke to our school when I was at UC Santa Barbara. And then he stayed at the apartment below where I was living. The guys who brought him there, he stayed there. So I went down there after the talk and hung out with him all night. And he was, he was, you know, at odds with Fauci in 1990. Mm -hmm. And what was going on, the way that the, the controlled medicine system works. So Fauci decides where the money goes and that kind of stuff. And more and more people are becoming aware of this. Thank God. I'm thank God. You know, we can we can stop the, the tragedy of the corruption that goes on at that level. I mean, Fauci spending six and a half billion dollars a year for the U.S. government. And let me tell you something, when big farmers going, hey, we need a little bit of this, we need a little bit of that and we need a few favors. They get them and they've been getting them for decades. And now it's resulted in a crisis. So I'm going to be talking about that. I'm going to be talking about exactly what to do if somebody has been injured. So you, you have a friend who's maybe they got the jab or they got one of them, but they're really now they regret it or something like that. What do you do? So I'm going to lay those protocols all out and my whole take on, you know, what the real what the Western medicine system has become and what the new system looks like. Ooh. And the new and by the way, the new system is going to be I mean, it's going to be biblical <laughs> what else to say because yeah. yeah just because you just imagine like for example like if let's say i was injured you know I'm, I'm in hawaii right now for the winter but when i get back to texas if i was injured i would not go to a hospital i'd go to my friend's 
Um, it's an inpatient, it's an inpatient private membership association. They're emergency room doctors, but I, if I go in there, I don't have to do any of the hospital stuff and I get everything handled by them. They're my emergency care physicians. And so I stay out of the hospital system because next thing you know, they're going to bill you for $58,000. Next thing you know, they're going to, they're going to say, no, you have to get the jab to come in here. And the next thing you know, you're gonna have to wear these masks for the next 10 years or whatever the BS is. We're already starting to develop systems outside of that with real emergency care physicians, just in because emergency care is something that Western medicine does really good. Um, but when it comes to long term care of chronic inflammatory conditions, that's something that I do real good and people in our field do real good. And so we're going to integrate those together into private membership associations that are the new hospitals. And as a member of that association, and you, let's say let's say you live near Austin, Texas, these guys are in Austin, Texas, um, you could actually just be a member so anything happens to you instead of going to the hospital you go there and it's a private organization government can't do anything about it it's like the boy scouts of america there's nothing the government can do about it it's private <laughs> david this is dare to dream what are you next dare to dream what are your future dreams and goals Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I definitely want to just keep on the trajectory that I'm going in the sense of growing these farms that I've got and bringing more of the magic of these farms to the public. Like, you know, I'll show you, watch this. You want to see magic? This is the honey we're producing from here. Mm, yum. Wow. Look at that. It's almost black. That's my December 2020 to black gold OG hives. Um, and this stuff is so crazy. You know, get more of this stuff out there to the world, more of these things. The, the mana of this, it glows. It gl it's, I mean, I don't know if you can see that. Jeez, I don't want to get on my computer. I want to smell it. <laughs> oh, you want to smell it now? It's yeah. like, well, let me see if I can get that. There you go. You can see there. Anyway, we can drink it. It's just insane. So, getting more of that, getting more trees in the ground, our fruit tree planting foundation. You know, whenever you support me, if you buy a product from me, Hey, a, a, a portion of proceeds goes to our fruit tree planting foundation. We planted over a million trees in the world, all over the place, war-torn countries, all over the United States, Native American reservations, all over Canada, all over Europe, all over Brazil, all over Uganda, all over Australia, everywhere we're planting trees. So right now my team's out planting trees and they're, they're hardcore. That's why I love them so much. It's like, man, I'm going to be reunited with them at the end of the month. It's going to be the best ever. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to see you at CLE and folks who would like to learn more or take part in the cleanse, et cetera, et cetera, go to David Wolf, W O L F E.com. And I end today's show with this quote from Thick Not Han Keeping your body healthy is an expression of gratitude to the whole cosmos, the trees, the clouds, everything. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Next week's show is going to be featuring the amazing Susan Slaughter. She's a paranormal expert and she's the investigator on shows like Ghostbusters International, Paranormal, Caught on Camera, and The Dark Zone TV. Thanks for tuning in to Dare to Dream. Subscribe, like, I read all your comments. And remember, create all your dreams into your reality.